Friends, welcome to First United Methodist Church Online. I am Pastor Sarah, and I'm so glad that you have taken time to join us this day. Whether you are at home, at work, or somewhere around the world, we are united together in this moment of worship. I hope that as you um, continue through this Christmas season, that you will feel the light and the love of Jesus Christ poured out upon you. And I hope that you feel the presence of God as we worship today. Friends, I am so grateful that my daughter Grace is helping to lead this morning's call to worship. So I will be the leader and speak a sentence, and then you're welcome to respond with Grace, saying the words that appear on the bottom of your screen. From the stillness of the blessed night of Jesus' birth, we come before you, O God, in praise and thanksgiving. From the astounding news sung to the shepherds, we thank you for the gift of your Son. Let our hearts keep the joy and peace of Christmas always. Let our spirits rejoice in God's presence with us. Fill us with your love, O God. Pour your peace upon us that we may be bearers of your good news. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning, Love Came Down at Christmas.
Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you to join with me as we lift up our hearts in prayer to God. May we pray. Holy and merciful and loving God, we are so grateful to you for the gift of Jesus Christ, and we're so grateful to you for this holy season in which we have celebrated once again the miracle of his birth and of his presence among us. It is such a season of anticipation. We have lit the candles in the Advent wreath for weeks now. We have read the words of the prophets, expecting to hear and see them fulfilled as we celebrated the birth of Christ. And now we have read the gospel story. With Mary and Joseph, we have made the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. With the shepherds, we have been amazed by the good news of great joy shared by the angels. We have remembered again the angel multitude returning to heaven and the shepherds going to proclaim what they have seen. And with Mary, we have pondered these things in our hearts. But we have also wrapped all of the presents and they have since been unwrapped. We have opened all of the doors or unfolded all the squares of paper on our Advent calendars. We have seen all of the decorations go up and by now some of us may have taken them down. And especially in a year like this one, it may seem to us that the season has now come and gone. We may believe that the reason for this season is no longer before us and we're moving on to a new year. But I pray this morning, O oh God, that you would help us not to be so hasty to move on. Remind us that when we ended the story on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day, that baby in the manger had not yet been named. It's only after Joseph and Mary leave the manger with Jesus that he becomes Jesus, that, that they present him in the temple. And so today, as we recall that story, help us, like Simeon and Anna, to be people who are able to rejoice and to glorify you for what we've seen in Jesus Christ. Help us to believe that the season is not ending, but it is merely beginning. And like Simeon, let us proclaim with joy and gratitude that we have seen your salvation, O oh God. And I pray that for each of us worshiping together today, that it might be true that we have seen your salvation. May it be true for us that in the unique opportunities of this season, in the words of the songs that are so dear to us, and in the words of the scripture lessons so familiar to us, that we might have seen your salvation. In our own hearts, may it be true that we have seen your salvation as we felt your Holy Spirit fall upon us, calling us to a closer relationship with you, perhaps having our hearts strangely warmed as John Wesley described it. I pray that each of us might have seen your salvation in the waters of baptism, in the prayers of the people surrounding us, that the Holy Spirit might fill us and enable us to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. I pray that we have seen your salvation in the ways that we've turned away from sin and wickedness and turned toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that we have seen your salvation in the ministries of the church. And even in this year in which so many of those ministries have been different than they might typically be, I pray that we have seen your salvation continually offered to the community and world around us through the ministries of First United Methodist Church. And I pray that you give us a willingness to continue to see your salvation as we reveal it to the world in our actions, in our words, in our witness, in our testimony. So in this world in which there is such conflict, in this world in which at the present moment there is such sickness and despair, in this world in which so many people may be packing up decorations with a sense now of depression or disappointment because it is all over, let us be the people 
Let us be the church. Let us be the body of Christ in the world, proclaiming loudly, it has just begun. And as we begin a new year, may we proclaim the salvation of Jesus Christ with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that the world might know new birth through Jesus Christ our Lord in this season in which we have received such joy from celebrating his birth. And so now, in his holy and powerful name, the name exalted above all names, we offer up our prayer as we remember together how he taught his first followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, as we worship God with our tithes, gifts, and offerings, we lift our hearts in thanksgiving to God for all of the resources entrusted to our care. But I thank you for your faithful generosity and sharing. If you'd like to participate in this morning's offering, you're welcome to mail a gift to First United Methodist Church, 
or you're welcome to give online. And information about both methods of giving is available on our website at firstchurch.org. If you're participating in this morning's worship service by social media, that giving information is probably in the comment section right now. However you give, thank you for giving. Just a few weeks ago, leaders of our congregation participated in one of those rituals and routines of a United Methodist congregation as we met with our district superintendent for a charge conference. Now, as we've so often said in 2020, this year, it was a little bit different. Rather than having one congregation meet with one district superintendent, we joined together with several congregations to have a combined charge conference. And rather than meeting here in this building or in the building of one of our neighboring churches, we met here online virtually. So it was different, but despite those differences, there was one thing that gloriously and beautifully remained the same. As in almost every other year, our congregation, First United Methodist Church, was recognized as a five-star congregation by the Holston Conference of the United Methodist Church. Now, each of those stars represents a means of generosity in which our congregation participates. The first star is for our giving to the annual conference. And of those gifts that we receive, we have faithfully tithed to the Holston Conference of the United Methodist Church. Those other five stars represent ways in which we participate in the advance, which is that special giving program in the United Methodist Church that allows congregations or individuals to offer direct ministry support to programs, projects, and missions that have been vetted and approved either by the United Methodist Church or by one of its agencies or one of its annual conferences. So in addition to our giving to the annual conference, we have given to at least one international advance, to at least one advance that is sponsored by the United Methodist Committee on Relief, to at least one advance that is nationwide here in the United States of America, and to at least one that is sponsored by our Holston Conference. So I want to thank you because your generosity makes it possible for our congregation to be a five-star church. And on top of that, even though it's not a sixth star, I was grateful the other day to receive this newsletter from our Smoky Mountain District. And there you see, circled in red, highlighted in yellow, First United Methodist Church was recognized and thanked for fully paying its apportionment to the Smoky Mountain District in 2020. It's all possible because of your generosity. I thank God and I thank you. And now may we pray together. Gracious God, the giver of all good gifts, thank you so much for all that you entrust to our care, and thank you for inspiring this generosity within us and among us. We pray now that you will receive all of these gifts that we have offered by all of these means and methods. Consecrate them, multiply them, and use them in your name to proclaim the good news and grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. And we ask these things in his powerful name. Amen.
Repeat the sound in joy. Repeat the sound in joy. Repeat the sound in joy. No more let's sing. No more let's sing and sing. Civil War, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's oldest son, Charles Appleton Longfellow, joined the Union cause as a soldier without his father's blessing. Longfellow was informed by a letter dated March 14, 1863, after Charles had left. Charles wrote, I have tried hard to resist the temptation of going without your leave, but I cannot any longer. I feel it to be my first duty to do what I can for my country, and I would willingly lay down my life for it if it would be of any good. Charles soon got an appointment as a lieutenant, but in November he was severely wounded in the Battle of New Hope Church in Virginia. The injury of his son, coupled with the loss of his wife Frances, who died as a result of an accidental fire, inspired Longfellow to write the poem Christmas Bells. This poem was later put to music, and it is known to us as the Christmas song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. As you listen to this song, I invite you to close your eyes and hear the words of anguish, of despair, and of hope and peace.
Our scripture lesson today comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, beginning at verse 22 and going through verse 38. Friends, hear these words. Now when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as a holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had re been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phenuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of eighty-four. She had never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Friends, as we begin today, I have a confession. I have really struggled with this sermon 
I have had it on my mind since before Thanksgiving when I was assigned this day and this text. I even requested a special song. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. I had an idea. I thought I was ready. And yet, this month I have found that I just couldn't find the words. For weeks, no thoughts, no words would come. I am recording this right now, a week late from its due date. I am thankful for Chris Lee's grace and mercy. I am recording this late because I had no words. I have struggled with this sermon for multiple reasons. I think the first is that I'm recording this long before Christmas, and this is a sermon for after Christmas. Second, those commentaries for this passage just were not speaking to me right now. The third is that I'm sad. This year, this Christmas, this Advent has been sad. Nothing is how I would have wanted it. And the circumstances and the world has just made me sad. But I think the most profound thing that has affected this writing of this sermon is that I am weary, and I know you are too. Usually this time of year leaves me tired from all of the other activities, um, the church services, the, the wonderful pageants, the things at school. I'm not tired. I'm weary, and weary is something different. See, friends, as I am recording this right now, Tennessee is the worst place in the entire world for COVID infections. And what makes me weary is that means that our neighbors do not care about us. Our neighbors do not care about each other. We are the worst in the world. And that is so defeating for a pastor who believes that we are called to love one another, that we are called to love our neighbors, and our neighbors are not listening. And all of that has made me so weary, so weary that when I open up the scriptures to hear this beautiful story of Simeon and Anna, people who have longed for hope their entire lives, I had no word. Simeon was so devout that the Holy Spirit rested upon him. And the Holy Spirit had told him that he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Messiah. And then one day, there was a tugging on his heart. The Holy Spirit moved through his mind and he went to the temple and he saw Jesus and Mary and Joseph. I imagine that Simeon had been waiting a long time because the first words he says as he holds Jesus in his arms, Master, Almighty God, now you are dismissing your servant in peace. The thing that he had been waiting for has finally come in this little baby. Anna, too, comes a little later. Anna hasn't left the temple for probably 50, 60 years, the majority of her life anyway. She has been fasting and praying night and day, waiting for something. And she is in the temple when Simeon meets baby Jesus. She is in the temple when Simeon shares his words of prophecy. And then Anna comes and begins to praise God and to tell everyone there about this child who will come to redeem Jerusalem.
and I find myself still waiting for that beautiful redemption. I would love to say that by the time you actually watch this, December 27th and beyond, I will feel that because we will have celebrated the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, because we will have embraced the hope and the love and the joy and the peace that he is. But that's only a week away now. And I, I see waiting for redemption still in my future. Simeon and Anna waited, and they were filled with joy. And I have waited this month for words, and all I had was tears. Yesterday, when I knew the pressure was on because I had to send this in, I was overwhelmed by it all. And so my husband Dave sent me on a walk to clear my mind, to get my heart rate up, to remove these tears from my face. And it was a gloomy afternoon. It was about 44 degrees. The sky was overcast. It was almost about misty in feeling. The sky and the temperature reflected my being perfectly. A little sad, a little defeated, certainly uncertain. And I walked from our house down the road, through the park, onto the greenway. And as I walked, I did not listen to anything. That is normally my custom. I like to listen to some podcasts as I walk, but I didn't yesterday at first. I wanted some calm. I wanted some peace. I wanted to hear the world around me. And what I heard were birds chirping in December. What I saw was a few children playing on the playground. What I passed was the creek running bubbling over rocks, the sound of water rushing. I looked to the ground, it was a little muddy, but I knew under that mud, life was working its way to return again in the spring. And halfway through my walk, when I turned around to head back home, I put my earbuds in, and I turned on a piece of music. I turned on, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. It was a song that I had requested over a month ago for today, for this service. Now usually I'm drawn to the bridge section that says, and then the bells, then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. And that gives me great energy, and I love that part. And I believe that part. God is not dead. God is not sleeping in the midst of this weariness. And I did pick up my pace when it came to that section. As the music swelled, I walked faster. But that is not the line that caught me this year. The one that got me was like the C section. It was in the final verse, in the version that I was listening to. Then ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth goodwill to men. And it was that moment of hearing about the world revolving from night to day that I remembered that the darkness 
always turns into dawning. That the light always comes from night to day. I remember those words from John 1. That in the beginning was the light, was Jesus, was the light, was the Word. The Word was with God in the beginning. The Word, Jesus, is the light of the world, and the darkness cannot overcome it. I might still be waiting on redemption. I might still be weary right now, but I do know the truth that the world does revolve from night to day, that the darkness is not the victor in this, that God's light, Jesus Christ, is always, always, always going to overcome this darkness. And someday, Someday soon, we are going to dance like Anna. We are going to raise our arms in praise, and we are going to say like Simeon, God, thank you. Thank you for this redemption. I feel your peace. My friends, I hope this for you today, that you do feel God's peace. But if you are like me and you are still weary... Please know that the world revolves from night to day. That redemption is here and it is coming. And that the darkness, no matter how dark it feels, the darkness is never going to win. I pray that very soon, the weary world will rejoice that we will be able to sing and dance again. But until that time, wherever, however we are feeling, I know where the victory is. I know what is going to win. And it is not weariness. It is not sadness. It is not a virus. It is the light of the world. It is Jesus for us, all of us, all of us. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, Once in Royal David's City.
Friends, go now in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion with the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen.